All right, we are ready and good to go. Before we begin, I want to tell you guys this this video is going to be huge. It's going to be the best video <laughs> that you'll ever see. It's going to be amazing. You can play it over and over again. It's going to be amazing. It's huge. That's for you, RJ. <laughs> it's going to make the agile great. <laughs> yes! <laughs> Put that on a hat. <laughs> yeah. All right, so, okay. Um, so what we're going to talk about today is the concept of um, pulling versus pulling. Pulling versus pushing. Mm -hmm. So the concept, um, basically, when we talk about pushing, it's uh, when we try to get uh, somebody to do something. So we'll, we'll push something on a particular person or a team. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that's like okay, but I want you to read. I'll say, well, you have to read. I'll push it on you. Right. Uh, so that's an example. Uh, and the other one is the pulling. So pulling is where we anticipate somebody at wants to do something and. Uh, they will pull information. So, they, for example, they will come, you know, the team member may come to us uh, as coach and say, hey, uh, what do you want to do this? What are your thoughts? What are your suggestions? So that's the concept between, uh, the concept of pushing and pulling. Okay. Uh, so let's talk about that. Um, your experiences with teams, you know, um, what have you noticed, uh, you know, any team that behave in a certain way and how, how do you work around that? So let's talk about that. So to tie in the conversation that we had last time about coachability, we'll talk about two types of teams. Um, one of them that's kind of all in. I don't know. I'm probably looking at the extremes. Looking at one of them that's all in, and then we look at one that's maybe challenging things a little more. We look at those in, uh, separately. <clears throat> but pull versus push. So I have found in my experience when I was a coach, mm -hmm. or not even a coach, but a scrum master, when I entered into a situation and I was trying to pull, push a framework, mm -hmm. for lack of a better term, right. down a team's throat or right. down an organization's throat, uh, it didn't really have, I mean, it stuck, but it didn't last. There wasn't a lasting effect because it wasn't their idea. They didn't, it wasn't something that they were fully bought into. It was okay. this one guy or group of folks who were okay. pushing for it. Okay. I've seen... And then on the opposite side, on the pool, I have had teams where they'll reach out to me and they'll say, hey, we want to, we're interested in doing learning about Scrum. We're right. interested in learning about that thing that you're doing right. with your engineering teams. We don't do software, but we're, we really want to know. And what I've learned over time in just a couple of years of doing this is the teams that go looking for the information, because they've already identified that they've got a problem they have a need. Right. Right. So they go seeking the information and they're pulling. Right. Uh, it tends change tends to stick longer with them, or ideas tend to stick longer with them, or they'll take the time maybe right. to, to kind of review it. Um, that's kind of the experience that I've had in push versus pull. Mm -hmm. um, so that's that's way I think the they have a one. They have a problem they're trying to solve, right? mm -hmm. and so when they recognize that they are pulling. For information on how to solve that problem, right? So, up front, when a brand new team, you talk about that, it's more prescriptive, right? So we tend to push a lot more. So over time, then, when do you? Is there a time when you say you're hopefully you're stepping back and you want them to pull instead of push? So that's what I was going to ask you: is that have you had experience where you had to have been prescriptive and push, and it has stuck? with the team or it has carried on forward because i mean i i, I was talking about i've i've pushed and it's fallen right. on its face but right. i have heard that like sometimes you do need to be more prescriptive right. and i know that i as a coach can be mean to be more prescriptive right. sometimes so i think it depends on the team so when i evaluate a team is there is a time when i'm pushing mm -hmm. and then there's a time when i have to step back and i think it comes down to that relationship with the team mm -hmm. uh, for example there is a team that I know that the approach of pushing doesn't work. Mm -hmm. Even the approach of say, you know, we want you to do this. And because they perceive themselves as having more knowledge already, they are, you know, they are more, they figure out they're delivering, they're more agile, they're already great, so there's no reason to do any of those things. So at that point, you can't get in. I mean, no matter what you try, it's like, nope, we're not doing it because we're great. Yeah. Right? So. So for me, I think I'm kind of like you, where the push model only work 
with certain things, mm -hmm. uh, but sometimes it is not. Like, are you saying that it's better to, I don't know, is it better to push in the infancy of the team, like as it's beginning, because they're not, they don't know a lot of the right. things, so you have the ability to kind of right. push along, but you're at, but for you, the end game is, I don't want to be pushing all That's the time. Correct. That's correct. I want to give them just enough to get going, That's and right. then after that, right. they so seek them out. To me, I see the concept of, you know, they come to me and say, hey, I have a, a problem, you need to solve problem. So it's like, they need to go fish, do you fish for them? Do you show them how to fish? Do you force them and say, hey, I know they're hungry, I'm going to tell them you have to go fish. Mm -hmm. so, so that's the difference. And sometimes I think one of the techniques I wasn't used or, you know, with one individual was I saw this person, you know, with over conversation that the, the style that they have in learning things was actually trying out things. Mm -hmm. So they're like, yeah, I'm not going to read any books because books doesn't help me. I'm just going to go do. Um, for that individual, I struggled with that for a bit. It took me about a week to figure out what to do, what to say. Yeah. Um, and then eventually I came up to the conclusion, you know what? I'm just going to be really honest and truthful with that one individual. I say, hey, let's have a chat and say, look, I've been struggling to try to see how I can provide you this feedback. I don't know. So it's raw at mm -hmm. this point. So this is what I see is that in my opinion, is that in order for you to get better at what you do, you can't just try. Sometimes you actually have to seek outside information that will help you there, get you there faster. Yeah. So reading a book will make it there faster. Um, that was kind of a rough conversation. Yeah. Right. So the person walked away and eventually happened was that when we get to our book club, when we read the book, I found that that person actually read more than I did already, which mm -hmm. is very interesting. So I had a conversation with him and said, hey, what happened? He said, well, you kind of sparked something for me. I said, well, what is it? I said, basically, it's, I'm reading because I need to get better at what I do. So there is a purpose to that. So therefore, he then pull and start reading. Yeah. Right? And I could have pushed all, all the I want, but that won't happen. So because he sees the need for him to do it, so he's himself is pulling and taking action at that point. But you gave just enough of a nudge. Just enough of a nudge. To possibly get him to start right. thinking about it. So I think, I think at the end of the day is the push and pull is, we want people to pull, but what do we need to do to enable them to pull, right? Does it, uh, going back to what we said earlier, do you think that it's, so what I've noticed is with teams that tend to pull or look for information right. or come to me as a coach, you're like, hey, we need help with that, is that they've already come to the realization like, right. we have a problem, yep. we're going to try to solve it ourselves yep. first, but when they try to, they, they don't have the tools for right. it, and then they go, they know who to go look for. I think it's just getting them to recognize that there is a problem. Right. And if the teams or individual does not see a problem, no matter what we do, it doesn't work. You can push all day long, and they're going to reject. Every time you push, there is a reaction, and they're going to push back. Yeah. Um, so getting to that is the most difficult thing. Now, how does this tie into something that you've been talking about in terms of the elephant and the rider? Does it tie into that? Uh, can we use that concept to say apply it to what's pulling? Do we help them figure out how to pull? It depends on the person. Because it's uh, with David Frank's thing on the elephant and the rider. He's talk from what I remember, his talk was on an engineer. But I'll expose or kind of like, you know, show a little bit of who I am. I, the type of person that I am is I need somebody, if somebody pushes me, I will turn and do the opposite thing. Right. And, and right. It's a really bad habit. It's a bad right. trait. Uh, but I d have that rebellious nature that I will... <laughs> I, think, I think we all do, right? As yeah. As by nature, we're going to do that. But if someone gives me the suggestion, it's like, hey, look, how about taking a look at this? Right. It's more subtle. For So for me, my nature, I don't know what it was, the elephant or the rider is, I want to go out and figure it out on my own Right. before anything else so before anybody teaches me or anything I, I hey you know what cool let me read about it let me learn about it and then let's have a conversation mm -hmm. about it some people are the same way some other mm -hmm. folks are more open to i have no idea teach me tell right. me what i need to do yeah. and it's just kind of reading the cues uh, of so, that person so i think teams that are brand new would be more open to being pushed yes right would yes. that be true? Would, would that be a true statement? Or would you say it's more of a 
pulling because they so I guess it depends on the teams. If the teams recognize that they're new, therefore they want to pull, say, hey, we're doing this. Maybe it's not the best thing. Charles, give me a suggestion. So that'll be pulling at that point, right? Yeah. But I think it takes, when a team is brand new, I think you have to push at first. As a coach, as a manager, as a leader, you have to push. You got to teach them about your culture, process, products, mm -hmm. all the things that we talk mm -hmm. about. Um, but I think that you have to push up front to set the ground, the, the, the foundation. Mm -hmm. And by foundation, I mean, it's like, mm -hmm. this is what we do, this is how to do it, this right. is the guidelines right. to follow. But give enough leeway where you can steer your own course. Right. Right. Um, so you push up front, but I think that if you keep your, the way that you instruct too narrow, mm -hmm. then they're always gonna expect you to push. That's then true. you've taken away the team's ability to think for themselves, to self-organize. Right. Which is where I wanted to ask you what you thought about this because leaving leeway for a team to wander, not wander, but, you know, veer off the right. road every once in a while for, we've got NBA backgrounds. Yep. It's counterintuitive to what we're taught in school. Right. So, you know, my question to you on push, pull, and then giving the teams that much leeway is, for anybody, coaches, scrum masters, mm -hmm. managers, or supervisors who may be looking at these videos, what would you suggest to them that their instinct is, I can't let this team fail, I can't let them veer too much, right. they've got to follow the path. Right. What would you... So, so for me is that for them to pull, you, they must realize that they have a problem. Mm -hmm. And giving them that leeway to fail allows them to see the failure and then to recognize hey i've got a problem or we have a problem so now i'm gonna go pull mm -hmm. i think if you continuously push and shelter the team what happens is that the team don't see the problem they don't recognize the problem and they're like well it's just richard and charles saying it. yeah we don't have a problem because we're staring them or we're, we're protecting them yeah right uh, and there was a really clear example was uh, um to, interesting enough on Tuesday, uh, on my uh, night where I did my ta Taekwondo classes, right, and I had a young kid, and you know he's learning, and I was you know trying to also help coach the person, mm -hmm. and he was doing a move that was wrong, right, and I turned around, he was right beside me, and I said, "Hey, switch your leg," and he did it, right. Grandmaster came up to me, he's like, "Stop doing that." <laughs> so Grandmaster picked me up on his back. <laughs> and try to throw me down because I help the individual. And it's like, no, you can't do that. You got to let him fail. Ah. Even at that stage, which is nothing to do with software, but it was very interesting to watch that he came up with, hey, I've asked you to come help also, but true, if you are his friend, you have to kick mm -hmm. so that he will block. Because if you don't kick, He's not going to block. He's not going to be able Same. to learn down the road. So that failure is important. Yeah. Uh, so it was interesting to, to see how even that works in that environment. Um, so I think you have to, have to let them fail. Yeah. Uh, I think up front, sometimes it's okay. Um, so I have another different team. And, and to me, a team that is, in my mind, mature enough. Mm -hmm. And for this team, they see themselves that they are producing, they're very matured. Um, Nothing works for them. No matter how much I suggest, they don't take it. Mm -hmm. Like, no, we got it. We've done this before. We've done it before. No, we're not going to do this. Yeah. So I'm at that junction at this point. It says, maybe is that we push up front, then eventually get to a pull, and maybe they'll get to a point where we now actually have to push. So yeah. It's almost a cycle, right? So it's like an endless cycle. So depending on the situation, you may have to come in and say, you know what? I hear what you're saying, I, I'm just gonna go push. Yeah. And that may or may not work, that may fail. But sometimes that may be needed. So there, there is a situation, I think. I think it goes, you know, we keep talking about push, pull, and I've said a metaphor and it's probably gonna get butchered over and over again, but it's one that I've used in the past to kind of describe what it is that we do as coaches right. with teams is at the very beginning, so I, I think of it as a wheel sitting on its spoke, just sitting right there. Right. And it's just sitting, it's not moving, mm -hmm. it's got all this potential energy, but you can't do anything to it. Right. Until you actually, as a coach, get them started. So 
That's the initial push. Like, this is what we do. I'm going to help you out at the beginning. To the moment, and then catches it and helps you. Exactly. So you get this team, and what you're hoping to do is to give them enough momentum at the beginning so they go on their own. Right. But occasionally... You still have to spin. You still have to, every once in a while, it'll either lose momentum, it'll start to wobble. Yeah. And as a coach, you have... The best thing that we can do is observe, and with the slightest subtle touch is... And get it Pretty back into motion. Yeah. And then that's the, the that's actually probably the, the way I would put it, as opposed to the way I used to do it as a manager, is I was very hands-on, and I look at the way I used to do it, it was the equivalent of tire spinning, okay, now I'm going to grab it, right. stop it all together, right. and then spin it again, right. as opposed to just, you know what, these guys have an idea of what they're doing, just give them a nudge. And I think that's what we do, and I think a lot of folks outside of the agile world uh, and maybe actually some other thought leaders have a really hard time with that concept because they don't failure is not accepted and that maybe is a, that is probably a, a, a great topic for another talk but yeah. failure is is so taboo yeah everywhere you go uh, and, and that's true because I mean I've had eight years where you know failure is not an option nope period you, know, you don't even bring it up yeah right you say you know we, we're gonna fail then you're done Right, so so that's that's definitely a good topic to, to talk about. Yeah. Um, anything else to share on this? I think it's pretty lightweight. I think the, the concept is pretty lightweight. Um, I think it ties into coachability. Yeah. Uh, it ties into Shuhari model. Yeah. Um, you know, teams will get to a certain stage, they will either fall back, and the techniques of pushing and pulling, um, in my mind, simple enough to recognize that, and trying to figure out how to get teams to pull. Yeah. Uh, it's probably the most difficult thing to do. So would it be, if we were to leave this talk with, hey, this is the advice that we give, what would you say to, if like, let's say a coach came to you and said, right. I'm, I'm starting up this new team, you've got this, we've talked about this right. now, what would, what would be the advice that you would give them? So I think, for me, ideally, you would want to present them the, you know, the core values and things like that. Here's why we do things. Uh, set them on that path, uh, and then you probably want to be prescriptive up front. Here's mm -hmm. a scrum, here's whatever how process you do, set them on that. But I would say reinforce with the why you're doing things uh, mm -hmm. so that it, they understand it. And maybe at that point, then you step back. Uh, so to me, it's creating that to start spinning the wheel up front takes a lot more momentum, right? So, so that's the part I think you got to do is giving them that. Yep. Um, I think that would be what I would say, hey, try this. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if that's the right thing, but it feels like that's what I've done in the past. Uh, so give them the information, have set them on that path, give them the why, and then step back and see how they go. Right? And they'll start moving and then you add on, you keep adding some stuff on it. And catching the moment to explain the why when they feel is important. Yes. I think that's the really important thing there is catching that moment. And it's so hard. It's like you have to be there to catch that moment. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think, though, to add tack on to that, one little thing is to resist the temptation to want to jump in or yes. swoop in as yeah. a coach or as a scrum master or even oh, as a manager. Pro owner. I yeah. Pro owner. Right? Yeah. You, you don't want to fail. You do, you want to make sure your your feature gets in there. You don't want the team to fail. So you, you kind of being very protective of the team at that point. Yep. All right. Okay. Cool. Good one. Good one. <laughs> um, folks, if this is your first time you're listening to or watching uh, this conversation that we have and you have a topic that you would like for us to cover, let us know. So we're always open to that. This is a common conversation that we always have. Uh, we've just been finally taking the time to record and capture this on video. And if you have any comments or questions on what we talked about today, feel free to post and we'll get back to you uh, as soon as possible. If you don't post anything, we've got a thousand topics we could go to. I mean, we could talk forever. I'm pretty sure you don't want to hear that. So give us your thoughts, give us your ideas, and we'll roll with it. Awesome. And we're going to do a wrap. Let's do this. This is Master Asian Call and DJ C Rod. <laughs> yes. <laughs>